Okay. So we are um, going to be talking about registers today, uh, Friday, November 13th. The homework that is due that's coming up is homework nine, which is due Tuesday of next week, November 17th. The next homework that will be assigned is homework 10 that will be posted Tuesday of next week and it will be due after a week. The next studio that you guys uh, should be working on is studio 7 and that is due uh, two weeks from today, uh, maybe three weeks, I don't know, let's see, I know it's, uh, right, so about uh, just less than three weeks, uh, but then we lose one Wednesday due to Thanksgiving break. So you have a lot of time and it's, you know, an interesting uh, studio. Uh, in fact, what I recommend with Studio 7 is for you to choose a message that you make scroll on your 4-7 segment displays. That means something to you. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a um, you know, uh, something that you want to say to someone in your family and you want to, you know, display that, record that and send them uh, that video. Uh, so in the past, students have done very... Um, uh, you know, it, 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 very nice things uh, with this studio. Uh, so take advantage of that. Now that you guys are home for the holidays, um, you can you can you know make something scroll that means something to your family. Uh, the only problem here is that some of the characters that you would want to scroll may not be very easy to display on the seven segment display just because of that eight pattern. Uh, but other than that. This should be an exciting one because you can uh, put your own personal touch on it. The The last studio for this semester, Studio 8, is going to be due the last week of classes. So that's December 9th. Uh, it will be a Logic Works studio. Um, so Studio 7 is going to be our last FPGA studio. And Studio 8 will be our last uh, studio which will use Logic Works. All right. The daily quiz for today, quiz number 19, uh, please complete that on Gradescope. You have uh, the entire day today to, to do that. Okay, let's start talking about registers and shift registers. So let's quickly kind of zoom out and look at how we have gone on. So we have first designed a latch, so in the sequence of uh, sequential circuits we started talking about a latch and then we used a latch to design a flip-flop by connecting it in the uh, master slave configuration and then we are going to use flip-flops to design registers and the the one particular flip-flop that is uh, especially useful in the design of registers is the data flip-flop because registers are essentially placeholders for bits. So you may want to uh, hold maybe four bits in one particular place. Um, and you know, there might be a variety of reasons. Uh, hold on, you are right, the slide hasn't changed. Let's see, let's try this again. Share screen. Okay, WebEx is being difficult again. All right, hold on you guys. Hopefully now you guys are able to see the screen. And 
let us see how long this cooperates. Okay, uh, so registers are placeholder for bits and there might be many reasons why you would want to hold bits at one particular place. So for example, in a computer system, you might have a 8-bit register which is associated with the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, uh, in which, you know, uh, some designers usually uh, have flags. So for example, you may have a zero flag, which means that when the result of an uh, arithmetic operation is zero, that particular bit in a register gets to one, right? So by just monitoring that one bit in that one register, you, you know what you can track whether the arithmetic log uh, the result of the arithmetic logic unit was a zero or not, negative or not, uh, whether there was an overflow or not in, during the arithmetic operation. So registers are used at multiple places and their, their primary uh, uh, purpose is to hold certain bits for uh, a short duration of time. You don't change that um, very, very often but you do change that from time to time depending on certain uh, situations being becoming active or ina inactive. And the way it is useful is the user simply has to uh, monitor certain bit locations to know how the uh, uh, program is uh, running, right? So you can use that for troubleshooting as well. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, th there's a type of registers called shift registers in which you can move data around you can do a right shift you can do a left shift you can do a circular shift and we'll talk about where shift registers could be useful so that's what we are talking about registers using d flip-flops like i said storage registers we are going to store data without changing it um, but when we do want it to change we have the ability to change that we simply need to load something new into it um, a D flip flop is going to give us one bit storage register. Uh, in the figure at the bottom here, I have sketched four D flip flops, and that is going to help us make a four bit register. So what does the register hold? Well, the register holds a particular uh, bit, right? So say for example, the uh, leftmost D flip flop here, the output of that is Q3 and the next to that Q2, Q1, Q0. So those outputs of the flip-flops are essentially going to tell us what are the contents of this four bit register or eight bit register or how many ever you need. So for example, if you wanted to make a eight bit register, you simply have to use eight D flip-flops. So in this case, uh, we have a positive edge trigger design Right, so you have all the all the four D flip flops are triggered at the positive edge of the clock. So let me quickly write show you the positive edge of the clock, and when that happens, you can load a particular four bit word into this four bit register. So, for example, say you know just just in, as a uh, example, let us say we need to. Um, load or let me use a different word uh, let me use write write 1010 zero, one, zero into the register so suppose that is our goal we want to write 1010 zero, one, zero into the register so what would we need to do to do to accomplish that the first thing that we would need to do is to make the 1010 available at the input of the D flip flop. So for example, if I zoom in over here for this, the first thing I would do is make one available here, zero available here, one available here, zero available here. So all the D flip flops are now getting that data input 1010. And then I would simply wait for the next positive edge of the clock. With those inputs already stable, Remember with flip-flops, we have to worry about the setup time and hold time and all that. So suppose now we, our inputs are stable now, 1010 one, zero, one, zero at the D inputs. And all four D flip-flops are synchronized to 
to this master clock, right? Because they're all responding to the positive edge exactly at the same time, because it's all connected together. So what is going to happen soon after there is a positive edge of the clock? We simply are going to be able to write 1010 because that one goes over here, right? After the positive edge, that becomes a one, that becomes a zero, that becomes a one, that becomes a zero. And that is exactly what we would write into the four bit register. As simple as that. Uh, now, what did we do here? We did a parallel load, right? We loaded the four bit register, all the bits at once in parallel, right? So we did a parallel road, uh, load, or you can call that, uh, say, parallel in, right? All at once, and they were going into the four bit register. So there is nothing, um, you know, uh, when, when you think of a register, you're thinking of the flip flops and their outputs are dictating what the value is in those particular locations in the register. A register file stores a group of words of data, right? In this case, we stored four bits. That's one word of data. Now you specify which word you are going to read or write. So the example that we did was a parallel write. Uh, and if you wanted to read this register, all you would have to do is monitor the outputs of the D flip flops and that would correspond to a read operation. Uh, there's a question in the chat box. What issues can occur if the D flip flops aren't all the same edge triggered? So if they are not all synchronized to the same clock, then the problem is they are going to be dis responding at different times, which means that the, the obvious problem first is that all these um, bits that are supposed to go into the register may not all go into the, into the register at the same time, which could cause some concerns to the user, right? So if, if the user wants all of them to be loaded at once, uh, that, that will not happen because they are not synchronous now. Um, and that can, can uh, pose a different challenge for the user depending on how they how uh, he or she is using the register. So um, another way of looking at it is if if it is a very high speed application in which the the writing of the register and reading of the register is happening at a fast rate, then that would that would become a bigger big issue. Uh, and you wouldn't you wouldn't want the D flip flops to be uh, asynchronous. You would want them all to be in sync. Let's move on and uh, look at another example here. We have added two things to our previous diagram. One is this source of uh, a group of four words, uh, four bits, right? So this is zero, one, two, three, all the way to F. So in hex, you are seeing all the possible values that you could possibly load into these four D flip flops. And at the end here, what you're seeing is a seven segment display, which is simply going to uh, be used to read the four bit register. And right now it is it is showing five. So how did we reach five? My guess is the user would have had to do this. First, five should have been loaded into each of these flip flops. Five is what? Zero, one, zero, one. So the most significant bit here, Q3, that went here, zero, that went here, one, zero, and one. And then the user would have had to wait for the positive edge of the clock if all of these were positive edge trigger D flip flops. We, we would have had to wait for that. And the moment that positive edge happened, just soon after that, uh, specifically after the propagation delay of the D flip flop, those bits would have been up, would have appeared at the output. Say for example, zero here, one here, zero here, one here, and all those uh, will are connected. See, all the outputs of the D flip flops, all the cues are connected to this 
uh, four bit to uh, seven segment display converter, the display here, and that would show five. Now, in order to work this to work, we also need to be careful about the reset. As you can see here, the reset input is an active low input. How do I know it's active low? Because of this bubble right there. So the bubble right now is signifying that the reset is an active low input. Active low uh, reset input. So this can be used to uh, make all the flip-flops go to zero, 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 zero. So all we would have to do is flip this switch to zero and then all the things that go to zero and you will see a zero at the end. But if you want something else to be stored there, then you would have to inactivate reset, which means make it one and then uh, uh, get something new into the D flip-flops. So let's do another example here. What if I wanted to display C? goal display C what would I need to do I'm displaying C here and C of course is in, is represented in hex so C is 12 12 is what uh, 1 1 0 0 right so in this case what what we would do is you would pick a 1 here 1 here uh, 0 here 0 here one one zero zero and then you would wait for the positive edge of the clock and as soon as that happens you will see a C right here All right so that's how you can uh, this is again a parallel load right so we are clocking in four bits in parallel or we could reset to zero and we have talked about that active low reset here All right, so this is essentially how you could use a D flip flop to design a four bit register and you can just keep expanding this into an eight bit register. You would need eight D flip flops for that. Now, the, the reason why a data flip flop, a D flip flop is working really well over here is because you're not changing the input bit, right? You're not toggling it, you're not setting the output. You are simply taking whatever is at the input port the D input and after a particular timing event, you are making the output go to that, right? So it's, it's no manipulation, it's no changing of data, uh, which is what a register is, just storing the data. It's not going to be uh, changing, uh, manipulating it, toggling it. <laughs> Questions here? This may be the simplest possible thing, but what is the source? Well, a source is, uh, you know, maybe four switches. Or maybe output from uh, some other component. The, those four bits are coming from either, you know, a user input like for example switches or push buttons or those four bits can come from some other component in your computer no matter where they come from you would use uh, them to uh, connect them to uh, another question I'm a bit confused on on the bottom note okay so the bottom note says clocks in four bits in parallel you see what we are doing here we are giving four bits from the source as the inputs to the 4D flip-flops and we are connecting the clock, the same clock to all 4D flip-flops. So essentially because clock is what triggers the input or the writing uh, event to the register, we are clocking in four bits from the source into the four D flip-flops or into the register. Or if you were interested in making the, uh, the register contents to be zero, 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 in that case, we could use either simply a reset input here. So make it low, it's an active low reset input and all the Q Qs, Q3, Q2, Q1, Q0 will go to a zero. 
So in this case, we are using 4D flip-flops to either write four bits in parallel, which is another way of saying clocking in four bits in parallel, or you could use uh, it, uh, or you could use reset to sort of initialize it to all zeros. All right, so I hope uh, that answers your question. Let us now take a look at a standard chip here. Uh, does the length of the clock wire ever become an issue? Well, uh, it does only when the, uh, the app, it depends on the application, right? So if the application is very high speed, then the length of the wire, not just for the clock, but for everything else matters. So it would depend on, 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 the, on, this, on the, the application. If it's slow speed, then the length of the clock wire or any wire is not gonna matter that much. Uh, but if it is a high speed signal or high speed application, then it starts to matter. Also note that, you know, if you were building this using chips on a proto board, then your wire is going to be much longer than what it is going to be when you actually put it on a PCB. Right. When you actually design a register on a PCB, it takes very, 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 very small amount of space. And the, the, the wire or the connecting things, which are called traces on a PCB, those are not going to be very long at all. All right, let's take a look at uh, 74X175, which is a quadruple D flip-flop. So that means a four bit register it, ha it is made out of D flip-flops and it has a clear input. And this clear input is a synchronous clear. So let me highlight that here. This is a synchronous clear. What does that mean? Uh, it means that you would have to wait for the positive edge of the clock to clear it. In other words, you see over here, the clear is an active low clear. That is an active low clear here. So when you make this input, say, go to zero, what would happen? Let me let me actually wire that in blue. I'm connecting this to ground. What would happen to the outputs? Note there are four outputs in true form and there are four outputs in complemented form. So when I click that, uh, when I make that clear input go to ground, what would happen to all the outputs? would the outputs be zero, 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 zero after it is cleared, right? So the outputs will get cleared, which means these would go to zero and the complemented form will go to one, right? That happens when you clear, but because this is a synchronous clear, this change at the output will not happen instantly at the instant of you connecting clear to ground. That doesn't happen immediately. It will happen only when it sees the next positive edge on the clock. So these get cleared in sync with the clock. Yes, data sheet. That's the only way for me to tell it. Yes, absolutely right, Jeff. All right, now let us say we, we cleared it, right? So we, we, uh, we, we started with this. We, uh, uh, you know, connected the clear input to ground. It was an active low clear. And we waited for the positive edge of the clock because it was a positive edge triggered design. As you can see, positive edge triggered clock here. So we, we waited for the next positive edge. 
and as soon as that happened all these outputs were set to four zeros or four ones depending on whether they were true form or complemented form now let us suppose you want to do something else suppose you want to um, load my goal is here to load uh, B in hex into the 4-bit register. What would I need to do? So B is 1010. Zero, one, zero. That's right, 1010. Zero, one, zero. So the first thing that I would have to do is Actually, let me color code this. This is in red now. Right, I'm using red now. So the the first thing that I would need to do is uh, D3 is the most significant bit, yes. You see, whenever you see the numbers, D3, D2, D3, Q3, Q2, those uh, indices, right, 3, 2, 1, that is telling you the significance. Higher the number, higher the significance. So the first thing I would need to do if I want to load this is to unclear it, right? So I would need to connect this to say some high voltage, say plus five using a pull-up resistor. That will make sure that now it doesn't get cleared. The next thing that I would need to do is provide 1011 at the input of the, the 175 chip most significant is D3, so 1, 0, 1, 1, that needs to be provided. And then I would have to wait for the positive edge of the clock. And as soon as the positive edge of the clock happens here, I should see 1, 0, 1, 1 over there, and 0, 1, 0, 0 over here. You guys see that? So a couple of important things here. It is uh, important to know that the clear here is synchronous. So we need to wait for the positive edge of the clock in order to clear the the four bit uh, D flip flop. Um, and now if you want to load something new into it, then you need to uh, inactivate or disable the clear and then provide the inputs that need to go into the flip-flop so you see this this stores the four bits in parallel you you provide the input over here you then clock through one more positive edge and that will get the inputs into the register all right questions here Now let us take a look at what is inside this 74X175 chip. So essentially what we are looking at is what is inside this guy, right? And if you were to guess uh, the, the, the number of flip-flops, what would you guess? Four, right? So we need four flip-flops. So that's, that's, sort of set and the, the each flip-flop would give us a Q and a QN. So right away we know that uh, we are going to be able to get eight outputs from the D flip-flops. So essentially some design which has four D flip-flops is what you would expect. Let us see how it is. You've got the four D flip-flops here. One, two, three and four. The inputs D3, D2, D1, D0 are appearing over here. The outputs in true form are appearing over here. 1Q, 2Q, 3Q, 4Q. The outputs that were in complemented form are appearing here. Q underscore L, 1, 2, 3 and 4. Now let's talk about the clear clear was an active low clear where is that 
let us use something else for this green for this so the active low clear input is right there and it is going through a buffer here and then that is connecting the get then the output of the buffer is getting connected to the active low clear input of each of those flip-flops which means when I activate clear all those will get cleared at the same time however I still need to wait for the positive edge of the clock because it's a synchronous clear so next question is why do we need this buffer why couldn't why couldn't we just have cl connected clear underscore L into those four things uh, load time sync with clock mm, noise free signal goes to the chip okay so you are you are getting closer and cl why do we use buffer okay so here you see this clear might be coming from something that is uh, prone to noise makes the signal stronger absolutely right so when you use a buffer it will make sure that the logic level is restored so to a uh, to a high solid one or a solid zero such that now you can connect four things at the output of that buffer so essentially the need is to make sh the the fan out requirement right so to sa satisfy my fan out requirement which is the number of things that you can connect to the output of the gate i am doing a buffer and then i'm doing the connecting to four things now it might not have been a problem if it were just two d flip-flops i may have been okay but because there are four then I might need to build into the D flip flop some sort of safety and that buffer is that safety So the, the, there are other questions. Why does fan out matter? So fan out matters everywhere where we are connecting something to many things, right? So fan in matters when you're looking at the input, fan out matters when you're looking at the output. Now clear is, get, is getting connected to four things. So it's like four loads that are in parallel. And I would want the the buffer to make sure that your logic level is reinstated so that uh, we don't have any issue in the logic level uh, there's another question why can't you just make there there be an inverter with an active high clear yes absolutely right you can do that but the designers of this chip chose to use a d flip-flop with an act a negative edge trigger d flip-flop with an active low clear so it, it, it is, the constraint is the D flip-flop itself over there. But you're right, you could have, in theory, you could have done that. Uh, wouldn't a low voltage be an issue no matter how many connections? So because it's not just a matter of low voltage, right? It's a matter of high voltage. When you have four resistors in parallel, the overall resistance goes down and the voltage hence goes down. So it's it's not a bad, it's it's not a problem when you think about the low voltage. It is a problem when you talk about the high voltage. And clear, sometimes is low, sometimes is high. But it needs us to to give us getting the clear or not getting the clear functionality all the time. All right, let's talk about the clock next. The clock, which is right here. is connected to a NOT gate and the reason why we are connecting this to a NOT gate is because each of these flip-flops happens to be a negative edge triggered D flip-flop. That's the designer's choice that went into this 74X15 chip. 
So if I want the overall chip to be responding to the positive edge of the clock, and each of these flip-flops is a negative edge trigger D flip-flop, then I would need an inverter to uh, flip my clock signal itself. So that's why you have that particular not kit. Uh, all right, I hope you guys have uh, a good idea with this now. Let me highlight my Ds. Those are my D inputs and I have a bunch of outputs as well. Let me highlight 1Q, 2Q, 3Q, 4Q and then I have 1Q, the active low Qs and then for clear I chose a green signal. All right, questions about this? Uh, just for the uh, ease of use uh, here, uh, they can they can be many many reasons for for this, right? One is if a chip has say 16 pins, right? This is a 16 pin IC. If a 16 pin IC is there, um, I would hate to stop at 12, right? Like I, I, instead I can just use the complemented form and make it into a 16 pin form factor, right? So. Uh, it, 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 if, if this form factor allows me to monitor this, then why not just use it? Uh, but you're right, there is no, uh, it's not a very strong motivation to have a complemented form of the output, which is what we see in some of the other chips uh, when there are many outputs. So for example, if instead of four out four bit output, if you had an eight bit output, you probably don't see the uh, complemented form. You just see the true form of the output. All right, and that's a perfect segue into this because you, you see over here, you don't see any uh, complemented form of the output. All you see is cues that are in true form. The contents of the register are all shown in true form here. But this one is an eight bit register. So this is true form. Um, so whatever you want to get into the register, you would provide at the input side here. And this of course is an eight bit register. So it definitely needs one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight D flip flops. Each of the D flip flop is a negative edge trigger D flip flop. And if we wanted the overall design to respond to the positive edge of the clock, then we would need to uh, invert that clock as well. And that's what gets connected to everything else. Now, the, the new input here is OE, the output enable. So let me write the, the, uh, the description of this 74X 374 chip. This is an 8 bit register with output enable. And it is also a positive edge trigger design. Now, what does this output enable for? Well, first things first, the output enable input is an active low input, which is essentially controlling the tri-state buffers, as you can see here, and so on. So the description of this is
output enable active low input which is essentially connected to the tri-state buffers meaning all the outputs 1q all the way down to 8q will only be connected to the outputs of each D flip-flop when output enable is active when it is inactive then all the outputs would be in high impedance state so let let us write that so if OE underscore L was a 1 then this would have been a 0 which means that all these guys would have been in the high Z state dangling wires all of them however if this was zero output enable was zero which means it was active then this guy would have been a one and this guy all these guys would have been enabled tri-state buffers which means whatever is available at the queues will now be able to read outside of that register um, so so for example say we have uh, some arbitrary input here. Let us say we have 0 1 1 0 1 0 1 0 Right, so I've just taken up eight uh, Bits that I want to store or load into this 8-bit register. I would have to provide these inputs first make sure that well make sure that the output enable is active and then wait for my positive edge of the clock as soon as the positive edge of the clock happens all those would be available to be read at the output now what application comes to mind when you think about tri-state buffer which which application do you guys uh, think of when you when you think about output enable and tri-state buffer kill switch decoders and encoders okay so output enable and tri-state buffers their primary application is sharing of wires or buses so the, the the times at which you want multiple 8-bit registers to access one single 8-bit bus you would use something like this to make sure that only one guy takes control of it the all the other guys don't access it that's the primary reason for output enable along with the tri-state buffers so picture something like this suppose we have many 74x374 chips so these are 8-bit uh, registers with the output enable uh, capability so if all of them are connected to this common 8-bit bus which is also being accessed on the input side by some other 374 design then we would want only one one of these guys to control this 8-bit bus so how can you do that well you can do that by enabling only one of them at a time right so we are using output enable here OE used here to make sure only one 74x374 is able to uh, can write to the 8-bit bus you can read from it at any time right but only one guy should be able to 
right to it. So we, 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 we looked at the concept of party line, right? When we, we, when we were uh, sharing one wire with many wires, right? With, with, with many inputs. This is something similar to this, except it's not one wire, it is a party line. So it's eight wires at once. All right. So next, let us take a look at uh, some other registers here. Other octal registers, meaning other 8-bit registers we are looking at. The first one that we are looking at over here is the 74X273, which is an asynchronous clear. You see, remember earlier, it was a synchronous clear. So when we cleared the register, we had to still wait for the positive edge of the clock in order to actually clear it. But this particular chip, 74X273, allows us to clear immediately. So as soon as you make this particular input, the active low clear input active, that's it. You don't, you don't need to wait for uh, the uh, positive edge. So don't need to wait for positive edge of clock to clear cues again it's a 8 bit register positive edge trigger design right so these are all i hope you you guys are now familiar with this uh, so we are using we are going to be using 8d flip flops here uh, to store 8 bits of information and if you wanted to change what goes into them, you can just provide them on 1D, 2D, 3D, and so on up to 8D. So everything else is the same, except that the clear is now asynchronous clear. Another 8-bit uh, register is 74X377. Now this is, this has the ability to do a clock enable. What does clock enable mean? You guys remember from the previous lecture? If you wanted to uh, have the ability to enable the clock and disable the clock, you would not want to pull out the crystal oscillator from the board physically and then put it back in. You would want some sort of software control over when do you activate or enable the clock and when you inactivate the clock. And the way we, we are doing this is used, uh, having this uh, clock enable input. Now let me show you how this works over here. Everything else is the same, by the way. It's still a positive edge triggered 8-bit uh, register. 8-bit eight, eight D flip, flip flops in here. So 8 things going in, 8 things coming out. Positive edge, they are responding to the positive edge. Here we don't have the ability to clear, uh, clear them. So how would we clear them here? So how do you think we, we could clear? So meaning, what would I need to do to make all of them zero? Uh, make clock one, yeah, but, but that is not, mm, no, the, the only way I can clear the, eight bits or put eight zeros in it is going to be put eight zeros over here enable clock uh, enable the clock enable and then wait for the positive edge of the clock so only when this happens then you can get all zeros at the output because we don't have a clear input here. Now let's take a look at how this clock enable works. For that, I'm going to ask you guys to focus your attention on this. What is that? What if 
the en was a 1 what would be the outputs then well that's exactly what we are talking about here so uh, Ian, just just hold on for just a second. We are going to look at what happens when enable is zero. What happens when enable is one? Uh, the 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 simple answer is, if enable was one, which means it is disabled, you would not have the ability to change the contents of the register. So they will be the same. They will not be able to change. That's the simple answer there. So let's see. Uh, if Enable is, let, let us try to answer En's question first. Let us say En is 1. I will do En equals 1 here. Um, so I'm choosing this to be a 1 here. So if that is a 1, this is going to be a 0 here. And that is going to be a 1 here. In that case, take a look at this. There are two, na two AND gates over here. Which AND gate is now going to be active? meaning which AND gate is going to be uh, giving you something non-zero or something zero. The top one is active, right? You are absolutely right. And this one is not because this one is getting a zero input. So this is already a zero there. So what does the top, top guy get? The top guy is actually getting 8Q, right? So we are just focusing on this guy right here for this. We are just fo focusing on eight right so all the others are kind of similar so 8q gets fed back right over here uh, 8q so this is the previous output right that means it is the eight bit of what is already stored in the register so that is 8Q, that means that is 8Q, and that was what would get into over here. So in other words, if I sketch this as a two is to one max, and if I use my enable underscore L as my select input, when enable underscore L is one, I can say 8Q plus will equal 8q you guys agree with that when enable underscore l is 1 my next state for that 8th bit right here will be the same as the previous one because I fed it back yes this is the same for all q's so you see we are just looking at these two 8d and 8q so a similar two is to one marks followed by a, a negative edge trigger D flip flop, there will be seven more copies on top of this. So you guys agree with this? This uh, enable underscore L, if it is a one, my old eighth bit will be my new eighth bit, meaning I wasn't able to change the contents of the register. Now, when I actually enable it, let us do that in red. When I make this guy a zero, this guy becomes a one, this guy becomes a zero, this guy becomes inactive, this guy becomes active, and what do you get here? That goes to a zero there, but this guy, you see, you are getting the new input, 8D. And you get 8D over here, the 8th bit, 8Q plus, right, 8Q plus. 8Q plus will now be 8D. You guys see that? Now, if you just focus on this particular 8th bit, what can you say? When enable underscore L was active, the new eighth bit was able to writ be written to the register, whatever you gave at 8D. But when enable underscore L was one, disabled, it wasn't able to change because you fed back 8Q into 8Q plus. The old one was the same as the new one, right? Effectively disabling the clock. 
You guys see that? All right, I hope uh, you guys can uh, relate this to uh, two is to one mux and take a look at how the, the next state changes based on this. So that's your clock enable. Um, a, a quick note here, whenever you hear the term clock enable, you are thinking of a software way to disable and enable the clock input. Whenever you hear the term output enable, you are you should be thinking about tri-state buffer and the application of sharing the outputs. OE or output enable. That's what that's what should uh, pop up in your head. All right. New chip 74x373. This one output enable. You know what that means? The moment you see OE, what does that mean? Tri-state buffers, which means that you can use this to share an 8-bit bus. Yes. Right. So essentially, you could use these outputs and you can use many of these 7.3 chips and connect them to something like this right here. You can share an 8-bit bus with instead of 374, 373s will also work because you have that ability now. All right, that's output enable. How about the latch enable input? So this guy goes here, right? And then I'm going to say this guy goes right here. You see over here, we do not have a flip flop. We have a latch. Why do we have a latch? Because we did not, if we want, if our application does not care about precise timing control, then we are okay with being sensitive to the level of C. So we only need to use latches. So that essentially means that our design is sensitive. Uh, to level of C as opposed to edge of clock. What does this guy have inside it? It's an 8-bit register, right? Because you have 8 queues there. Uh, you said this is for slower systems? No, 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 no. S not slower systems. The application is not very sensitive to when the outputs change. So if you wanted the outputs to change as soon as the edge happens, this guy or this guy, right? That's a very tight window of time. So when you want that very precise control over when the outputs can change, you go for flip-flops because those are edge sensitive. But if you do not want them to be that precisely controlled, then you can go for edge uh, levels. So the output can change here, can change here, can change here, can change here at any time. Right? So that is an application where you do not really care about when that output changes. So that the time window is a little bit relaxed. The time window with respect to when the output can change. So that is relaxed. It's not necessarily for slower systems. It is for s applications that don't care about precise timing control over when the outputs can change. All right, so eight bit register. Uh, what else can I say about this? It is going to have eight D latches instead of eight flip flops It's going to have eight D latches over here. Um, so what would I need to do 
let us write one more statement here about the the latch enable so when I make C as one then can I say uh, one Q plus is going to equal one D that happens only when C is one and when C is zero one Q plus equals blank. Q last, perfect. So one Q. Perfect, yes, you guys are right. Now, I don't want to write one Q, two Q, three Q. What I'll do is I'll simply remove this one here, one here, one here, one here. And I will simply add N. where n belongs to the set of 1, 2, 3, 8. So these two uh, boxes here, those are, this guy is enabled and this guy is not enabled. All right, questions here. So, you know, just to just to summarize here, you see how on this slide we said C equals one and C equals zero. And we did not have a triangle over there. Different from triangle over here and us writing positive edge of the clock you see that that's the that's the difference between our older 8-bit registers and this one earlier we were changing the outputs with respect to the positive edge of the clock now we are changing outputs with respect to the level of c c being a high or low so that relaxes the 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 time times at which the output can change. All right, questions here, guys. All right, now with the D register, uh, the D flip flops configured as registers, what you can do is you can also do a shift right and shift left. And we'll see some designs that also use the flip-flop that allow us to do that. So for example, a shift right example here, how does a shift right operation look like? Well, if these are the original contents of your four D flip-flops, as you are clocking through, meaning more and more positive edges, or I should say more and more active edges of the clock, what happens is with every active edge of the clock, I should say, just write it down. After every active edge of clock. And I'm saying active because I don't know whether it's a positive edge trigger design or a negative edge trigger design, whatever it is, active edge of clock. After every active edge of clock, this guy goes here, this guy goes here, this guy goes here, this guy goes here, right? Those are, you know, Q3, Q2, Q1. Ugh, why am I writing two, three, two there? Three, two, one, zero, right? So those are the outputs of the D flip-flops. Uh, not quite. <laughs> uh, th there's a different different way. You could if you wanted to, um, but I have, uh, in the document, I've given you guys a, a little bit of a different idea to do it. Um, so after every edge of the clock, you see what happens. This guy goes here, this guy goes here, this guy goes here, and a new bit comes in. Right now, it is defaulted to a zero, but you could get an absolutely new bit in there. You could control whether a one gets in or a zero gets in, or it's a circular shift, but that is a new bit. 
and then after another negative uh, active edge of clock this guy goes here this guy goes here and then you get two new this one is from here and then you get another new bit and then this process keeps going right so this could be a circular shift which means the, the, the last bit kind of goes on to the next one or in certain applications you might choose to bring in a new arbitrary bit at the front when you do a right or a left shift and we'll see we'll see how that works out um, a famous application of doing this is sending a word bit by bit using a modem all right we do need uh, some way to initialize the shift register though because we had one zero 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 we we need some uh, way to initialize it to one zero 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 after that we can clock through as the bits get get shifted all right so let's take a look at the 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 design of a multi-bit shift register so let's take a look here we have a serial input and we have a serial output remember earlier we were doing a parallel load or parallel in all at once now we are looking at how do you do a serial load or a serial in meaning the contents of the register are being filled up one by one in a sequence one after the other and they are also being read one by one serial out or you can also call this serial out or serial access of course this is being used for writing and this is being used for reading writing two registers and this is being used to read from registers so how does this work let us suppose we do this let us suppose we have a certain uh, bit sequence that are we are trying to load into these registers so let's see what happens uh, I'm just going to arbitrarily write certain uh, bits here Say I have one zero one one zero one. Uh, let's just do that. And these are going into this serial in in that particular order. So what would happen after the first positive edge of the clock? Remember, the clock input is connected to all of them. However, the outputs here are cascaded one after the other the output of one becomes the input of the other and so on that's what allows us to do this shifting operation so what would happen to after the first positive edge of the clock what would happen just after that Can I say a one comes in over here, right? Because this one went in, and after the first positive edge, it came out over here. However, what about this one? 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 What is going to be over there? I don't know, because I don't know the initial state, right? I don't know what it was initially. So this would be all, all of them would be X, X, X and X. I don't know. No, well, I don't know. So it could be a zero. It could be a one. What would happen after the next positive edge? This guy is now going to go here. Absolutely right. And this guy comes in over here the next one after the next positive edge what happens then one comes here zero comes here and then new one comes over here one zero absolutely but 
if you continue this process for many, many, many cycles of the clock, what would you read out over here at the serial out pin? What will you read out eventually? You would literally read out the same sequence, right? You would eventually read out the same sequence that went in from here. You guys see that? Why wouldn't it be backwards? Well, if you if you if you put in this first, this gets read first. If you put in this next, this gets read next. This third, this is this is going to be third and so on. So it's like a bit by bit going in and coming out. So it starts occupying the output from the least significant first. Yes. So when you read it, it, you know, if you ignore the don't cares, the first bit that you will read is going to be the first bit that you put in over here. That will be the first bit that you read over there. The second bit you put in here will be the second bit that you will read here and so on. Because it's, it's being used for communication, right? It's being used for transmission here. You see that? RS-232 modem transmission. So it's like, you cannot mess up the order in which you are sending and receiving. Whatever you send first, you receive first. Now, another thing that I want to point out with this is, even though you can do a serial load and a serial access with this, I think we can also do a serial load and a parallel access with this. How do you think you can do a parallel access with this? Give each cube. Absolutely right. You are right. So if you monitor only the most significant queue here, then you read the serial out. But if instead I just monitor all the queues, that's my parallel load, right? So I can, with this design, I can do a serial in and parallel out. And I can also do a serial in and parallel out. Uh, sorry, serial out and parallel out. Both I can do with this, with serial in. Just use all queues. Yes, absolutely. You got it. that leads us into serial to parallel conversion. So you are, you are providing all your serial inputs over here in a particular order, 1010, 10, whatever. And by just monitoring the outputs of each D flip-flop, that is giving us the ability to say that we have parallel access or parallel out that is for what that is for reading we are reading the contents of the register here and we are we are writing serial load or serial in now you know there is a very good way to look at this here which is you may want to put all the bits into the register one by one serial load or you may want to do a parallel load put all the bits into the register all at once that was similar to kind of uh, how we started this lecture with multiple D flip flops getting all clocked at once and in terms of reading the register you may want to do a serial out for which you have to wait longer which is reading the bits one by one, or you may want to do a quick parallel parallel uh, access or parallel load by just monitoring all the bits of the register at once. Now we combine them, meaning we are going to try to do both. 
So let us see here how we can do serial access, parallel access, serial load, parallel load. We are going to try to do all of them in this one design. And in this one design, again, we have the mux. So I'm going to highlight a, a particular mux here. Uh, let us say I choose this one. And that is going to be over here. I'm sketching that over there. Again, I have a two is to one marks. Let us talk about the, the, the clock, which is easy. The clock input is connected to the positive edge of each of the D flip flops. So this is a positive edge triggered D flip flop based design. One Q, two Q and so on up to NQ. That is going to be the N bit register, right? So that is all of that is going to make up my eight bit register contents. Oh, this is not eight bit. This is N bit because I have N of them. And so if, if you uh, remove the clock and the outputs, what is left? I have an option here to load or shift load something and shift something and then I have the serial in input here if I wanted to put in things serially into it and so let me let me do that this is going to be my serial load and what is this for This is going to be for parallel load. So I can do a serial load. Okay. So I can do a serial load here and I can do a parallel load using all the 1D, 2D, 3D inputs, so up to ND. And then I can monitor the outputs of all the D flip flops here to read. If I'm reading all at once, then I'm doing a parallel access. If I'm just using NQ, then I'm doing a serial access. As simple as that. Now I, I also have this load or shift input here. So let us try to uh, see if we make this one, what happens. So if we make this guy one, this guy would be a zero, right? Which means this is out, this is out, and so on up to this is out. And this is in, this is in, and this is in. You guys agree with that? When the load or shift input is one, that is going to be my state. I've put in the cross for AND gates, suggesting that, that their outputs will be zero. And I have put a check mark where I think that the output is going to be non-zero. So what is going to be the output of the bottom AND, and gate here? What should I write over here? One D. One D is absolutely right. And then one D goes in here, right? And after the first positive edge, one D would come in over here. So let us try to map that with, and the same thing would happen here. Uh, let me also finish this up. Uh, this will be 2D, and this will be 2D, and this one will go to 2D. 
you see I'm doing a parallel load here you guys see that uh, this will be ND this will be ND and this will go to ND so if I wanted to grab this red box and uh, graph it as a 2 to 1 marks I'm gonna use my load slash shift input as select and when it is 1 I'm actually doing a parallel in that is going to be my at the, at the output here is my what D input you see that when it is a one there then I'm loading the register with parallelly right using 1d 2d 3d I'm loading loading that into it now let's take a look at what happens when it is zero so if I make this guy zero what would happen this guy would be one this would be active no act yes no yes no which means all the crosses will go to zero here zero here zero here how about the red ones what would be the output of the top and gate when it is red uh, it would be actually in that case I will also color code this to red what would be the output here so let us say serial in can I say that yes which means serial in goes here after the positive edge what happens here serial in goes here right that bit goes there after the positive edge of the clock notice now that guy right there is actually connected to this which is exactly the same as what we had and the other ones are unknown absolutely right so this is kind of what we had earlier right serially clocking things through so if I go back and show you guys that is exactly what we had over there right the shifting operation one after the other that's what is happening over here with the serial input so when you when you have that load or shift signal to a zero that's what we do here we do a serial in So you see, we can do all four over here. We can do a serial in, serial out will be right there, right? So serial out will be right there. Serial out will be right there. And we can do a parallel load and we can do a parallel access. So all four in one, uh, oh yeah, it absolutely does, but it allows us to uh, use it in four different ways in, in order to do serial in parallel in serial out parallel out all four at once we can do in one one design for an end bit register so these four serial input parallel input serial output parallel output all of them are now possible with one design and yes it absolutely costs more You know, one thing that I find very interesting with such designs is using the use of MUX. You know, you guys remember when we were talking about MUX, as I said, these guys are my favorite components. Um, and this is the reason why, because you, you, can, you can look at each of these things, two AND gates and one OR gate and say, all right, two is to one MUX, what is going to happen here? That just helps in making so many components. And they're not just used in combinational ones, muxes are used everywhere, uh, which is why I try to see muxes wherever I can in my designs, which is which kind of helps me understand many of these circuits. All right, let's move on. We talked about serial output. You, the theory is uh, is just simply you know putting things one bit by bit, putting things all at once. 
reading things one bit by bit, reading things all at once. So there's nothing much over there. Um, let us talk about the universal shift register. So, guys, do we do we want to kind of stop here, or you guys want to go a little bit more? Well, you know what? I know the answer. Um, let us stop right there.